want to say welcome, Mr. Chester Higgins. Thank you. I never knew TV. It's an honor to be here. Um, cultural anthropologist, Egyptologist, legendary <laughs> photographer, spiritualist, and just an Irie Bergeron. Um, we're going to get right into it, right? First question I have is, um, I heard you once say in an interview, you spent a lot of time around elders, right? And uh, in retrospect, what are some of the great life lessons you learned from hanging around the elders? Well, you know, elders have had the experience that where we are going through. The human experience is, is a ceremony. It's pretty finite. Graph it out on A to Z. <clears throat> At one age, you experience this. Another age, you experience that. That age, and relationships and what have you. So I had the habit of, I had these favorite uncles and favorite aunts who I love being around, <clears throat> them and their friends. And as a youngster, being around them, playing my marbles or whatever, I could hear their conversations. And why was that important? Because just like reading a book, you can travel to other places. Listening to older people, I can travel to other situations and relationships that and find out about what people have experienced, what they do. So in a, in a sense, it's almost like a, um, a radar. This is, but possibly this is, wait, part of this is waiting for me out there in life because we never know where life and love is gonna take us. So I listen carefully because I learned so much about human behavior. They were dealing with human behavior so that <clears throat> I live vicariously through their, their experiences so that it gave me a heads up that when I came upon certain individuals or certain behaviors or certain types, I didn't really have to experience it all the way through to know what it is because my great uncles and aunts had already been there with similar situations, similar people. So I can see the arc of it. I can see that a person based upon um, how they, you know, they, they also taught me this thing about the three twelves. Mm -hmm. The first 12 feet away from you, how to judge, understand people, not judge them, but understand them. The first 12 feet a person is away from you as they approach you tells you about how they approach space, how they have a sense of themselves. The first 12 inches, <clears throat> they tell you, how they care for themselves, how they smell. And the first 12 words out of their mouth tells you how they string up a thought. So if you are, that gives you some distance <clears throat> because you know that that's an equation. You know that that's something that you can use, that they have proven that is true. So they look at you because, you know, old people have a way of measuring you, looking at you and measuring you. Well, what are they thinking? They're going through all these different kinds of formulas, like the, the, the law of the three twelves. So you wonder when you come up to an old person, how is it they know so much about you and you don't even know them? But not because they, and, you, and they don't have to know you personally like you think, but they can, they can tell but as a person a lot of things about you right away. Is it their understanding of uh, seeing the consistency in energies over time and they pick up on your type of energy? They see a consistency, yes. They see the behaviors of different friends, different young people, older people that play out. You know, observation is the basis of science. So they observe. That's why when I felt that when I went to Africa to work in a completely different culture, that I felt completely safe because I knew that all of us fundamentally deal with vibing each other. <clears throat> it doesn't take, you know, you don't really have to speak a language for somebody to vibe you and decide if they trust you or not, they feel comfortable with you or not. And then that's how I move. But I moved out of the confidence that I learned from my great uncles and uncles in my church community, in my village of 800 people in Southeast Alabama. Speaking about being in Alabama, <clears throat> can you share with us that spiritual experience you had at such a young age? I was uh, nine years old and I was uh, asleep. 
uh, must have been like after midnight. And um, I heard this twinkling energy in my head, not in the air, and it made me wake up. And when I woke up, I saw this apparition, I call it now. Uh, I saw this big white light on the wall, sort of in front of me when I sat up. And then the light opened up in the middle, and there stood a black man in like togas, the old uh, clothes you see in Ghana, or you think of Romans and old Greek. And it was just holding his hand. And then his eyes opened. And that was, it felt okay. I mean, it didn't feel ominous to me, so I was okay. I didn't know if this is what reality is here, you know? <laughs> Do we, is this what people experience? I'm not sure. Uh, and then it started to uh, move toward me. And I became a little well, concerned, and, but not too concerned until I heard it say that come to, <clears throat> I come for you or come, come to me. And then I got very upset because I didn't know much about the Bible. Yeah. I'd gone to church, but you know, kids, we don't, we don't pay attention. But I th thought I heard something about you, know, the angel of death. And I said, oh my God, could be, this be the angel of death? And I started to scream because it wasn't, it, it was part fear, but it was also part pissed off. I didn't want to die, and but the pissed off part was that, hell, I just got here. I'm only nine years old. <clears throat> I have to die already? So my, uh, my mother and my father and my grandparents broke into the room, and the, in the room had a, uh, a pull chain light, Someone pulled the light, and this, when they pulled the light, this apparition disappeared into the wall. It took, so my mother was trying to comfort me, uh, kneeling and holding my hands and rubbing them, and um, I began to feel a sense of, uh, that I was leaving them. My mother and the other four adults were getting smaller. And I began to get a, a feeling for another channel, another reality, or another car lane, as we may talk about in a way. But my mother didn't give up. She kept rubbing furiously my hands and she brought me back. And then they say, well, what happened? And then I told them what I told you. And everybody was baffled, except my grandfather, who was a minister and who chimed in by saying, no, this is the spirit. This is a call to the ministry. Well, I didn't know that. But the next day he gave me a Bible and <clears throat> I started reading and I sort of took to the scriptures like fish to water. And a few months later, I gave my, uh, about six months later, I gave my trial sermon and got my license as a preacher. And as a teenager, I was a preacher. Uh, and I was a preacher until I went to Tuskegee. Uh, two questions. Do you remember what your first sermon was, your trial sermon? Do you remember the message in that? <laughs> no, I don't remember. <laughs> and also, how was it socially? Because I know in that environment, like, the ladies like the preachers and all that stuff, especially young preachers. You're like a little superstar in a sense, right? Perhaps. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, but that's not what struck me. What struck me was that I became an adult <clears throat> in the eyes of adults. So I began to have more, I began to be a witness to more adult conversations. And um, people treat, so in the eyes of the adult, I had become a sacred being. And that's how their response was that he knows and should understand our conversations. Um, my peers, the young people, uh, I think, the, I don't think girls were, were interested in <laughs> I was the shortest one in the class, so I don't think that made a difference. Uh, but my buddies, you know, they, they start off trying to um, uh, get me to curse and do things, you know, naughty things. But, I was, but for some reason, I just wasn't interested in that. And so they gave up and they just called me Rev, and, and we were still friends. Um, but at Tuskegee, I walked away from the ministry. <clears throat> I want to talk about at Tuskegee. Uh, from what I'm, from what I understand, you were 
exposed to a lot of students from Africa. And they're the ones that exposed you to African leaders at the time? Writers and leaders, yes. All right. Um, were they also exposing you to African spirituality or was more just a political experience? No, it's more political because, you know, these, first of all, these were uh, graduate students studying in the sciences. Uh, you know, they come from upper class families back home. Uh, and they were uh, politically attuned to the independence movement. So the independence movement meant that they had, and they gave me, uh, introduced me to biographies of Haile Selassie, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who was, was just so pro pro so prolific in his writings. Um, and it's through them uh, and their African music that I began to develop a sense of oneness with my cousins from Africa. Uh, these people would not have been to spiritualism. That was something that grandparents may have been in, but their grandparents probably also had been converted to Christianity. Uh, and then their parents would have been Christians and so are they. Now that doesn't mean that they, and I don't recall them having Christian names, but you know, you could, you would have names, that, day names or what have you. Uh, and most of these kids were either Nigerians, South Africans, or Ghanaians. And uh, how was that interaction with you? Because growing up in America, especially at that time, I'm pretty sure uh, you had a, I won't say you per se, but there's a negative perception of Africans. So how was it for <coughs> you to interact with people who were brilliant, who were up to date, and dispel the myths that were circulating at the time? Well, you know, I think education you know, has a, is, is a great savior in a lot of cases. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> I write in my memoir about this, this delusion or illusion that we African people have would escape. Um, <clears throat> for some reason, my family was very, very uh, race conscious and my community were very race conscious. Uh, they loved themselves. They felt good about themselves and they uh, always sort of alluded that uh, we, uh, that there was a wisdom, there was something about us that came from another place. So I was never, and I know African Americans at the time, all wanted to escape and try to become lighter, browner, or almost white. Um, and I know that uh, we have this, we, we've developed this huge capacity of self-hate. But as Malcolm said, who taught you to hate yourself? It was not you. It's your enemy who taught you to hate yourself. So when you incorporate that hate, um, it's like you don't need to be in chains anymore. If I have if I have chains on your head, on your mind, that's that. So I never felt that I should wall myself off from the African part of me. In fact, I did the opposite because I learned quite early especially when I was a youngster, my teachers and my mother was a teacher and her friends, it was not in the curriculum, but they made sure that in February, we got the chance to have classes to learn everything about the contributions and the meanings and worthiness of black people. So <clears throat> I realized that, hey, uh, white scholarship is totally inadequate when it comes to us. So therefore, I sort of have this uh, default position to go the other way because I've discovered this and to realize that if there's something that we need to learn about ourselves, it, that it requires primary research. And there are other people who are doing this, but, they are, but were there other photographers? I hope at the time, uh, but I use my photography to do my primary research and by actually living and being with the people and embracing the multiple aspects of myself with my cousins on the continent. So uh, it was at Tuskegee where the disdain you developed for the presentation of our people and the media started? Yes. Well, you know, you grew up <clears throat> and you, you the, envi the media environment is always projecting whenever there's a picture of a black person in Southern media or national media, it's always pejorative. And you grow up with that, unless you have other people like your family who are correcting that and each day giving you a, 
a, another kind of image and story, it sticks with you. But I had people who were giving me other parts of that story, so I wasn't crippled by that. But it, I didn't give it much thought either. I don't think most African Americans, they just sort of dismiss when they see it. We cherry pick without realizing subconsciously. We just certain images we dismiss. Um, so when I was at Tuskegee, one day I had to visit an old man photographer and I noticed they have a picture made and I had noticed that he had these pictures hidden behind a curtain. And when the, when the door opened, that curtain went back and I got a glimpse and then I pulled, went back and I looked. I said, wow, <clears throat> these pictures were exceptional. They were pictures of black farmers doing the depression. Wearing whatever rags and coals they had, but full of dignity. And this man saw that with the camera and he captured it. And it made me think, wow, one, I like these pictures. Two, I know people who look like that in my village, my great uncles and aunts and their friends. And three, I know the only thing on their wall is a picture of, is a, a farmer's almanac because we're a farming community, pot cotton peanuts, and a picture of Jesus Christ. So I said, look, <clears throat> I have told this man, I want to make pictures, but I can't pay you to go. I can't commission you to go and do it with a student budget. But would you teach me so I can go home and make pictures of my relatives? So a year and a half later, I learned, I've learned enough from him. I've got a better camera and I go home to start making pictures because the reason I picked up the camera is that I wanted my relatives to see themselves on their walls. I wanted to see their face when they saw that someone thought that they were worthy, that their agency was important enough to be the third thing on their, on their wall. That to me was, was the reason it made my heart happy, made my heart smile, and that's what I did. And afterwards, I, I got involved in the civil rights movement and saw that my images, love for my, for my family in my hometown could be extended to my love for people of color in the country and in Africa and worldwide. All right, um, I guess many people face this crossroad. You're in school, you're graduating school. You have the opportunity to do many things, many things that are just beneficial to self. Why did you decide to pursue photography, but not only photography, but a photography that kind of wasn't necessarily commercial at that time. You're doing something that's beneficial to your people with limits income and limits possibilities. Why did you make that decision? Well, you know, <clears throat> it, um, photography became the tool to further my mission. I guess my mission has... Uh, I don't know if it's a ministerial thing of, of being, of taking care of the flock of the congregation, uh, or if it's just a, um, a racial thing, but I felt that here's a, here was a place that I could be of service. Um, and I had the energy and the, and the foresight, uh, to, to make that service happen. Um, the cause was sacred, the rehabilitation of my people and the, and the eyes of the public, because we are what we consume, says, says Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad. <clears throat> and if we can daily consume pejorative images of ourselves, then we then become, that we accept that as our norm. The problem is the same if the music. If the music that we hear is constant pejorative music, then we think that that is our norm and we become that, what we consume. So I knew that I could not um, uh, do away with the racist images that are out there. But I had faith that if I could just get on the world stage and make a contribution, over time, it would have an effect. So I've always, from the beginning, taken, looked at it as a long game rather than a short game. 
And yes, it's not easy to make a living as an artist, period. Whether it's photographer, painter, musician, blah. And I think that you know, my major was in business management at Tuskegee. So I always approached it as a, that I'm in business. So therefore, I have to find a way to bring in income. I have to have different irons and different pots so that it's, some may percolate and, and come to fruition at different times. I had to be able to deal with <clears throat> expenses. I had to deal with, so in the beginning, um, I had to hustle very, very hard. That's, you never stop hustling. I had to hustle for opportunities uh, to, to be hired by editors to, uh, to shoot stories because I want my stories in you know, real estate, in those papers, in those magazines. I had to hustle um, for grants back when grants were something that you, individuals could get. So you know, I got numerous grants until that ran out, but that helped me finance a couple projects. Um, but it's always uh, a hustle, even doing weddings is a hustle, but it's honest money. And you may say, well, why should your artist at your stature, I don't do these things anymore, but, the, but if that's what I needed to make my budget work, then, you know, it was something that the spirit had brought to me to do. I was not above that because, look, <laughs> weddings are a lot happier to be at than funerals. <clears throat> So you get an enjoyment out of it as well. But I accept it as a mission. I've always been on a mission. And that mission, so when I came to New York and I met my second mentor, I sat down and he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to change the image of my people in the media. He said, well, that's a pretty tall order. I said, that, that may... Is that the Rothstein? That's Richard? Rothstein. I want to ask <clears throat> you about that because uh, he was a white person. Mm -hmm. And he seemed like he gave you a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. during that time. So what was the dynamics of that relationship? Well, I came to New York looking for a teacher. I learned everything I could from Mr. Polk. But I knew that I needed, uh, in order for my eye and my images to be competitive and really break out, I had to learn how to be as good as the other photographers who were shooting people of color that I like. Especially those photographers you see who were shooting civil rights uh, confrontational pictures. I had to learn how to be good. Uh, I was not naive about that, and uh, I came looking for uh, teachers. And the way I did it is I went to a newsstand and I picked up every magazine that used pictures well. And I looked in the mass head to see who the editor, the picture editors. I called each one of them up. I say, my name is this. I'm a student from Alabama trying to learn how to be a photographer. I'm not looking for a job. I'm looking for training. I want you to look at my portfolio and tell me, since you see all the best photographers, what's the gap between where I'm at to where I have to be? Several places and people I went to were well-meaning, but none of them were teachers. And I went to Look Magazine and I had a sitting down with the photo editor Sam Young, a young man, but I realized very early Sam was not a photographer. He was a manager. And we're talking and we're finishing. And it was quite fortuitous that this short, bald head man stuck his head in the door. And he said something to Sam, and Sam straightened up in his chair, which told me that he was, this, he was Sam's boss. And he told Sam whatever he had to tell him. And then he looks at me and he said, well, who's this? What's going on? So Sam said, well, it's this young photographer from Alabama and trying to get some criticism. So this man says, okay, when you finish with him, send him into my office. So he closed the door. So he closed the door, I look at Sam, Sam looks at me and we know we're finished. <laughs> and this is the, so Sam says, you know, go out the door, turn right into the hall, that's Mr. Rostow's office. So I walk in, I sit down and I tell him, he said, well, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm trying to learn how to be a, a great photographer because I want to change the visual image of my people. He said, well, that's a pretty tall order. I said, well, that may be, but it's the only one I have. He said, okay, let me see your pictures. So I had a little portfolio, maybe about 12 images, 
And I put them in front of him and he took one and then he took out four pieces of paper and started moving around. And I realized, came to learn of what that was called as cropping. So he cropped the image and he says, come take a look. I looked at the picture and said, my God, did I make that? <laughs> he said, yeah, you made it, but you didn't know it. Because you got all these other things that's competing with the image. He says, what you have to learn is, is composition, design, balance, hundreds of things. I said, wow. That began a summer of going back to his office almost daily <clears throat> with new pictures for him to look at and critique. And that, this man taught me the, the, uh, the visual vocabulary, how to see. And um, after, and then after college, I came back and he gave me my first assignment uh, at Look Magazine was to follow Jesse Jackson for a week, which turned into a five page spread. In the and then I had two other stories on the, on the board when the magazine went under. But he was also helpful to me by then um, directing me and introducing me to Cornell Coppa, who started International Center of Photography, and Gordon Parks, who was a, who worked with him when he was at, uh, when Rothstein was at FSA. It turns out also that at the end of that summer, Rothstein sent me, to, he sent me to two museums. He sent me to the Frick. He says, here's a list of people I want you to look at. And he says, I don't, I want you to tell me, I don't care if you like them, I hate them. And what I care about is you can tell me why. And these are the people I want you to look at. So I did that. And then I, he sent me over to the, to MoMA, uh, to meet John Sarkowski and show him my work and, uh, do some research. And in that research of FSA photographers, I discovered that he was one of them. I had no idea who this man was. And then I discovered that he had pictures where he had been to Tuskegee. So, you know, the spirit is in charge. It has a way of working. So here, here's this, this, uh, this student from Tuskegee who's really eager to learn, who's uh, self-motivating, uh, and um, who just was soaking up everything. In fact, I, mean, I found out he taught photography. He published books on teaching photography. And Cornel Kappa says at the end of, after he died, that he thought of all the students that Rothstein had, I was a, the student who turned out to be the best. But <clears throat> Rothstein would say that Chester uh, took advantage of what I taught him. All right, uh, I want to move forward, right? I want to get into uh, Egyptian history. And um, all right, when you started to learn about African spirituality, right? Uh, were you conflicted because of your Christian upbringing? Well, I guess I started learning about African spirituality in the summer of 72. My first trip to Africa was 71 to Senegal. My next one was to Ghana in 72. The one in Senegal was just 10 days, then Ghana was a month. <clears throat> and in traveling up and down, uh, uh, Ghana, the, the roads of Ghana and trains and Chotro, uh, you find out that spirituality is a very strong thing along a stance parallel to Christianity. <clears throat> there, the, the priests who uh, use uh, uh, geomancy, uh, you know, throwing of the bones, or like we do. Uh, we, when you throw dice, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, and where they read, uh, up, they give you readings about yourself. Um, so, and then you, you discover that there is this uh, opposition going on within the culture itself between people who are Christian or Anglican and people who are uh, traditional. Or who tradition means simply those who believe in the sacredness of nature because nature is the body of God, whatever you want to call it. So <clears throat> I, being raised a Christian, felt uh, ambivalent. At the, in the beginning, I felt fear. But since I was there for a while, and I noticed other people do it, and they, nothing happens to them, they okay, I 
I had ambivalent feelings, so, but I was curious. <clears throat> What's going on? How does it happen? You know, uh, I'm interested in the who, what, where, and uh, what does it look like? And uh, how do you talk? How do, how do people talk about it? So that was my first introduction in Ghana, and I went back the second year, and I learned more, uh, and began to see the beauty of people's participation. Now, what prepared me was that here again, Tuskegee. At Tuskegee, one of my courses was world religion. And in that course of world religion, the whole it's a landscape of belief sort of open up because I realize that other people can believe in their God by a different name and they're still having the same experience, trying to come together with the Creator, the Spirit within them. And so that opened my eye in an expansive way to the reality that everybody doesn't have to see it the same way I see it. And yet we're all here. We're all gifts of this same Spirit. Like everybody doesn't have to speak the same language, but we all can communicate. I, I want to ask you something real quick. Uh, the people who were practicing Christianity, were they fully practicing Christianity or were they mixing it with their traditional beliefs? You have both. You have both. Well, you know, and that's because, look, what is religion? Religion is many things. It can be a lot of good things and it can be bad things, but fundamentally, Religion is what I call death insurance. The whole idea is that everybody has, uh, there, there's this lotto game. You play in the lottery. But, and you believe, if I do this and this and this and this, when I die, then I've done enough to take care of my soul, trans, trans, uh, transiting over to the unknown. Hopefully the unknown in my mind is my my, in, my, in my mind of imagination is a nicer place than this. Death insurance. But the other thing about religion is that it limits your reality, your living here. Because instead of your concentrating on the heaven that we live in, you are concentrating on our heaven yet to come. So you don't live fully in the present. Now, there are reasons for that. Understandably, the present can be very terrible to a lot of people, that the hereafter is more appealing. And obviously the people who feel that the most are those who opt out and commit suicide. But for those who, where that is not an option, religion becomes an option of escapism. Uh, you brought up something, right? And I'm, I don't want you to straight argument, but you brought up the concept of suicide, right? Why is, do you believe in your research now? Why do you believe suicide is frowned upon or what I say banned in the Bible? Well, because it's, an, it's the option. Well, first of all, the Bible in any is, is based upon control. It's pacification. If you're a leader of any country, if, you're, if your subject starts dropping off, that makes, you, that makes your leadership, your, your thing less powerful. So you don't want you don't want your consumers or your subjects to be dropping off. So and that's on one level from power position. On the second level is that everybody else who's left behind feels a little more of a coward for being here. So it confronts two different things. So rather than having to deal with that confrontation, it's best to just ban it. And um, since we're dealing with death now, I'm jumping around just because we're here vibing. Why did Egyptians not have a concept of hell like the concept of hell is in Christianity, even though Christianity pirated? Because it's an African religion that believes in nature. African religions that believe in nature, the sacredness of nature, original sin does not exist. Corruption happens. That's why you do ceremony, to cleanse the corruption. But sacred uh, original sin does not exist. And in African religion, the woman is important. She's a sacred deity. The first thing that happened in uh, patriarch religion is that the sacredness of the woman is, de is deliberately, intentionally thrown away. She becomes the center of everybody. She becomes the problem. Whereas in African religion, the woman is the, the vessel, is the authority. Who, who was your first teacher? 
Who was your first judge in your life when you had a, a problem between you and your brother or somebody bickering? Who was the one that said no? Who's the one that judged it? It was a woman. Who's the one that gives you a sense of self? Sense of, and that comes from a sense of love, which gives you a sense of confidence. It comes from the woman. So that's why in African religion, the woman holds a high place, an equal place to the man. You, and in African religion, a man is half his mother and a woman is half her father. And all of these halves are at peace with each other. That's what we call balance. That's what the Egyptians call ma'at. My understanding of Egyptian spirituality is this. They observed nature, right? They saw a balance within nature. And it seems, please correct me at any time. It seems they try to create a system that mimicked the balance of nature that man could use. Because they saw man had a little, we have some issues going on. Is that kind of? It's absolutely correct. All right. Um, now, in regards to the divinity in Egyptian spirituality, the divinity of the woman, how did their observation of nature lead them to see the woman as divine? The woman is a giver of life. We cannot have life without the woman. So the Egyptians had, they had several concepts. But the overarching concept is something they that we talk a little about. I mean, they have a concept of rod and, you know, underneath that shoe, what have you. But no, but the overarching concept in Egyptian theology is the mother Newt. Newt is the night sky. Newt in her blackness, and they made this as an image where a black woman is arching over the planet in the downward dog position. Her arms are extended to the west. Her feet are on the east. That's the, the solar plant, the, 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 the solar pole, not the magnetic pole, but the solar poles. So in the afternoon, when the tired sun is setting, her arms become like a runway. And the tired sun comes up her arms and is swallowed by her, where it is recharged for the next 12 hours in her body. And at the end of that recharging period, and as it travels through her body, that light is twinkling, and because she wears a dress with holes in it, we see the twinkles of the stars. In the morning, on the eastern side, after the sun has recharged itself, she gives birth to the sun again. She gives birth to the sun again, and two things happen. The thing that we see, obviously, that happened is the sun god, Ra. But what we don't see is something invisible that happens, that's a catalytic conversion that causes it to happen, is the spirit that they call, you may have heard this word, A-M-E-N. I'm going to ask you about that. Don't go too far with that, because I want to gonna, gonna delve deeper into that, right? I wanted to you to speak about, I'm glad you brought it up. I want you to speak about the Egyptian origins of the word Amen and how it differs so much from how it's used in Christianity. The top God of the Egyptians, the, and the only God of the Egyptians, is the invisible force that causes nature to activate. And that force they call, they named, is A-M-E-N. When you say that word, even now, you feel a sense of completeness and righteousness in what you've uttered. That's an Egyptian utterance. So, whenever you say at the end of a prayer, you know, it's the same as the acknowledgement of the one and only God in the universe. And we use it as a prayer to make it so. Whatever our wishes, we wrap them up in that prayer, like a bundle, like a gift, and then we tie it up, when we tie it up and release it, we do amen. Because it's now the spirit is in charge. Amen is in charge of everything. Nature is the body of amen. Nature is the body of amen. So now other people have come and decided, okay, we, we the patriarchal religion decided that nature is no longer important. So in the Egyptian religion, Nature 
is the body of God. Nature is alive. The first thing that happened, and another first thing that happened in reactionary, the reaction against nature religion that the patriarchs did is they killed off nature. Nature is no longer alive. Nature is no longer sacred. They killed off the, the sacredness of the woman. The woman is no longer sacred. Now, and then they gave human, man, the dominion over everything that is nature. So now you can sell nature. Now you can uh, destroy nature. And you don't even have to worry about uh, saying, I'm sorry. Uh, and not only did the Egyptians believe in this, anybody who believes in nature, whether they're the Native Americans, whether they're the Asians who believe in nature, they all approach nature uh, as, the, as, the, uh, as being the cause of, all, of us at all. That's the part I don't understand is that they pirated everything, right? They, they, they copied everything, right? Not but only they, did they copy, they plagiarized the Greeks who occupied the Egyptians for 250 years, who despised them, saw the power in, in, in pacification of religion. They plagiarized the Egyptians and then turned around and demonized the very people they plagiarized. But they, I don't understand why they didn't copy the concept of balance that they used to give their their environment sustainability. Because that would eliminate the, the doctrine of exploitation. Everything is intentional. I'm not sure if I'm saying this name properly. Uh, Akhenaten? 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 Yeah. All right. Um, I want to talk about Akhenaten, who many historians say is the first monotheistic pharaoh, right? And the first Jesus. Well, <clears throat> the first monotheistic pharaoh is a misnomer. The Egyptians only believed in one god the sun, the sun, the force behind the sun. So when the, the, we have images of the Egyptians worshiping the sun five times a day, because what, what, what the Europeans can't get into is the conceptual act that was also the physical, they can see the physical act, but they can't see the conceptual act. They can't see that what the Egyptians were doing was they were worshiping the transit of Amun which is the power behind the sun. So in their mind, they weren't worshiping the physical disk of the sun. They were worshiping the window upon the resonance of Amun. Too complex for the European mind to, to wrap itself around. And, and to show you what I mean, look at statues and look at paintings of ancient Egyptians. Look how smart those people are. And look how comfortable they are with their thought, with themselves. Then look at the Greeks, look at their contemporaries. Look as how much of an effort they have to make to make an impression because they're acting out of flesh and they're acting out of ego. And they are not smart as the Egyptians. The Egyptians were very smart people who lived the life of the mind. They had no ego, no, no, necess no, no necessity for the ego. Now, they were very, and that, that being, they were the very first people to come up with an understanding of the Creator and our relationship to it, and that we are one big family, we are all part of nature. And this led to that being a very peaceful society, which made them vict, which allowed aggressive societies to victimize them. But that's a, a later story. All right. Um, I also want to talk about um, Unas. Unas. Right? And yes. The, uh, the One of the pharaohs. Of, of the four, of, we call pharaoh, but I have to say two things. I've learned two things. Reading the glyphs, there's no such word as pharaoh. It's per'ah, number one, which means great house. Before now, we continue, what's the origin of the words? Where did they get this word pharaoh from? I'm going to tell you. Number two, <clears throat> pharaoh is a Hebrew word that came from the Greek. It is not an Egyptian word. It does not exist. So when we say pharaoh, we're calling it the name of the rulers of the occupiers of Egypt, the Greek who came later. So it's a later term for the ruler. But it's not the term that the native or the local Egyptian, local Africans used themselves. All right. 
Uh, can you speak about the scriptures? Um, I believe it's in his tomb, Unas. Unas. Yeah. Well, Unas was a fourth dynasty king. Or, you know, the greatest, I think the best way to refer to, to these kings, there's not king, not pharaoh, but they were what the Pope tries to be. They were the number one holy person of the country because all of Egypt was nothing but a, a country of temples. And the most holiest ones formed a layer on the top, and out of that layer, they elect who would be the head priest. They had high priests. We know those titles. But they had the ultimate priest who came out of the high priest rank, became the head of the country. Um, but, and I forget your question now. Oh, uh, the Holy Scriptures. In the so Unas, Unas, when he's buried under his pyramid in his tomb, on the walls of his tomb, he believed in this, this scripture that they have been his priests. And the scripture really is about two things. It's about making peace with all the different elements of nature and making a prayer that it now can join a certain part of nature far off in death. And that place they want to join is the uh, belt of Orion. If you look at the belt of Orion, there's seven stars, and those stars are talked about in the Bible, especially in Revelation. But you have these four points on the end, and you have a belt of three. And their prayer was for their spirit to join the energy of the universe on the, in, on the end star on the left. So in these prayers, they talk about moral compass, that I am deserving of this because I have lived this kind of life. So in that moral compass, it then talks about uh, Unas, it talks about their concepts, their wrestling with issues of where am I, who are we, where do we go? They deal with the concepts of create, with uh, creation, uh, with uh, <clears throat> A moral compass that later become, became the Ten Commandments. Is that also the Declaration? The Declaration of Innocence. Because in the, Dec in the Declaration of Innocence is quite interesting how it became transformed. Because by the Egyptians who felt that it was the moral way to live is to take self-responsibility to live righteously. So their Declaration of Innocence, which are 42 of them, when you die, you judge by these 42 judges, is one of... I have not, I have not committed sin. I have not committed adultery. I have not committed murder. It is your responsibility, your declaration of innocence when you would go to before the judge. It's not someone else telling you, taking the responsibility away from you and saying, thou shalt not. No, it's your voluntarily responsibility. I have lived a righteous life. And because I've lived a righteous life, I deserve to go and join my ancestors, my village of ancestors of other righteous people. And the most righteous of those, when they die, their spirits, their souls ascend. Ascension is part of the, the Unas's scripture. They ascend to the heavens and they ascend to the point in the sky of, or of Orion's belt. Uh, on Unas, right, what is the creation story that's on the wall? The story of the water, standing noon, how the uh, the God uh, from the sky, we, we're in this, the whole night sky is a, is a sea, a sea of darkness, a sea of, out of that sea of darkness comes the water, the mound, and out of that mound becomes creation, things, uh, animals, and then out of that becomes uh, a creator who's, who, does, who spins his pottery wheel and creates humans. Um, this is their creation story. And then a part of that is they have then, uh, and this is why the Greeks get confused when they talk about paganism, because what the uh, part of the creation story is that there are so many basic elements in, in our environment, in our nature. One of them is light, one of them is air. One is uh, terra firma, one is water, all of these different elements. So in the Egyptians' uh, pantheon, 
uh, it's kind of like a card catalog or uh, an alphabetized thing. You have different managers in different areas, all under the head of the sun god, which represents activation of all, all things. Under him comes these couples, four different couples, they call the triad. Uh, but these, this is not paganism. This, these are managers. Uh, but in the, in the juvenile mind of the ancient Greek, uh, they did whatever they, they could only, they dealt with whatever they could understand. And their understanding was limited. All right. Um, I wanted to jump back because we didn't fully finish with um. How do I pronounce my bracer's name again? Akhenaten. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, can you break down the similarities between his story and the story of Jesus? Okay. Well, I don't know because okay, Akhenaten and his wife <clears throat> uh, believed, like his father believed, like all Egyptians believe, that the one God is Amun, and that Amun is behind the sun. Akhenaten changed and says, okay, uh, we're going to give the sun a new name. Um, and we're going to worship the sun as an example for everybody else to follow our example. I think that the, and you know, people, you know, Jesus was trained in Egypt, in the temples of Egypt, in this same religion of being um, at peace with everything in nature. I don't think, the, I wouldn't say the examples between Jesus and Akhenaten, I would do it the other way. Akhenaten was a spiritual revolutionary. And he had the immense wealth of a whole empire to change and, the, and, a, and, and to make a change and make people see that there was a, what he did is he democratized faith. And what I, by that, this is what I mean. Before Akhenaten, the same faith, you as a person, in order for you to access your pipeline to Amen, you had to go through priests. <clears throat> you had to go through uh, offerings of, of meat and animals and what have you. And Akhenaten says, okay, I'm closing all the temples. You don't, we're putting the priests out of business. You just stand up. You know, God is giving you air. God is giving you light. This is nature. All you have to do is rejoice in that. Stand up when you breathe. <clears throat> God is in, coming inside of you. Uh, when you look up at the sky and you just stand in the sun, just feel God. God is all around you. You don't have to go to the priest. So that caused a big problem economically because temples were big business. So those people have built their careers, the ancestors have built their careers on Templeton and that business, they had a problem with Akhenaten. But I think what also shows is that Jesus took that message of peace that he had learned in Egypt and to, he felt, hey look, I should export this this is really good. I'll go back to my people, the same people who tried to kill you when you were a child. So he went back to his people and what happened? That story did not end well. So on one hand, I think it's a difference between someone who has complete wealth and power, makes an effort to change people's attitude about belief, and someone who had no power and made the effort to change about belief. And both of them uh, left something behind and both of them had successes and both of them had failures. All right, two questions. Why did the Bible leave out uh, Jesus' time in Africa and learning from Africans? And also, is there any uh, historical documentation that you have found in your research that um, shows that Jesus was in Africa learning during that time period? Okay, first thing I have to say to you is the Bible standing alone is negative evidence if you have nothing of the time period that authenticates or collaborates what it says. <clears throat> Egyptians are uh, obsessive with record keeping. Egyptians don't talk about the things that the Bible talks about. Egyptians don't talk about a Moses 
because Moses is a common name in, in the Egyptian language, M-O-S-E. Um, so the Bible is, for, is a thing that only matters if you have faith, that you believe what it says, but there's no historical evidence that corroborates what it says. There is historical evidence, there's a lot of Egyptian evidence that <clears throat> talks about that same period, but it talks about the people who, uh, the, the Exodus story is all convoluted because they, they mention uh, Paramses, which was a, a northern capital, which came at a much later time in Egypt. Uh, I contend that the pharaohs, of, if there was ever, uh, 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 the Egyptians were not a slave society. The, the Greeks and the Romans were slave societies. If there was ever a um, slave uh, thing going on other than captures from wars, the, the Egyptians don't talk about it. Um, so, you know, one have to say, well, if, you know, if it wasn't talked about, did it really, does that mean if it didn't exist or it did exist? You know, that's, that's when we get into negative evidence because one can say, you know, the same about the Exodus. You know, well, there's nobody else that says this, so, you know, does it really exist? Um, but, you know, the patriarchs who made the Bible, we have to remember they were enemies of Egypt. That's why in Egypt gets a bad rep in the Bible. That's why when I first went to Egypt in 73, and I'm looking at the walls, and I have been conditioned, if you live on the Christian world, that the Egyptian, ancient Egyptians were super bad people, and that they essentially had no souls. They were just, you know, cold-blooded. And you look at these walls, and you see images of African people kneeling, African people praying, African people embracing their, 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 their sense of amen, their godship. African people using water for purification. African people using fire for incense. It's a whole different kind of story. It's like, well, what, what happened to that story? Why isn't that included? And as you begin to read that real story that's left behind in stone, and our ancestors were the richest people in the world, the most powerful people in the world at that time. And they were smart enough to know that we would forget that that history would be corrupted. I think that's why they put it in stone. And in your work, right? I want to ask, how, how, what is the process of changing your perspective to see things in their true form? Without it being clouded with the preconceptions you have about something? Well, you know... Um, <laughs> it's embarkation pains. You know what embarkation pain is? Let's assume you were on a hike and you were going, following a path, and all of a sudden the path ended and there was a big gully drop, 20, 30 feet, deadly. But not far over that gully is a continuation of the path. You can't, it's too far for you to open your legs and just walk across it. You have to jump across it. And in jumping across it, most people will decide, oh, since I don't have enough faith in myself, don't have enough confidence in my physical ability, and that I'm going to survive, I'm not going to do it. But there are those who say, okay, this is a problem to be solved. If I run back 20 feet, and do like the athletes do, a jump with my faith in myself, step out on faith in myself, confidence, and that land is going to be there, I can bridge that. That's embarkation pains. So when you, so I had my moments of embarkation pains, uh, questionings, because you know, you, when the, the, pro, the thing about learning new stuff is that the crisis is, but I know this other stuff, and I'm comfortable with this other stuff. If I learn this new stuff, am I going to be comfortable again? Am I going to be uncomfortable? Have I been a traitorous to this? Have I been, is this treason to me? What, what is it? Um, and these are questions that are real questions that each person have to ask. And I take the position, and I step out on faith, that we black people who are 
who, who have been lucky enough to realize that what the enemy has been teaching us is a lie that we need and we want to find the truth about us. My first trip to Africa, I was scared as hell because, you know, maybe the white lie is right. Maybe we are savages. Maybe we are swinging from trees. Maybe we don't, you know, think. Maybe we can't. So when I got there and that air hit me and I saw the people, I was quite relieved. But I had to take in, I had to step out, I had to pass that embarkation pains of that self-hatred that has been drilled into me and has been drilled into my sisters and brothers because we all live here. And we don't, and it's so natural to us that we don't even see it as hatred that's projected to us. You know, it doesn't matter whether a Republican or a Democrat wins the election, the horse is still racist. And a horse is still going to make laws that disadvantages you. And not only disadvantages you here, but it make worse laws that disadvantages our cousins on the continent. They're trying to keep the secret away from you. But hey, don't, don't let it happen. You have the power. You have the power of inquisition. You have the power to question. Question. And you have the power to pierce through you, because you do it every day. You, you pierce through the bullshit. So now give yourself the power. Give yourself, save your money, pick a place. I tell people, if you're first time going to Africa, go to Ghana. Because as people speak English, we Americans, we don't love speaking any other language. People speak English. Those of you who are religious, they have a lot of religion there. You can go to church. You can use the telephone, the cell phone. You can, you know, use a computer. You can hang out in the best beaches, the best hotels. Whatever you, whatever you know, if you want creature comforts, there's creature comforts. If you're okay with roughing it, you can you, you can rough it. You know, either way, it works. Uh, can you tell us about the Hebrew history in Ethiopia? Yes. Well, <clears throat> in my book Sacred Now, uh, I look at uh, the Hebrew presence in Ethiopia. Uh, I was photographing. I, had, I was fortunate to photograph a lot of. Uh, Ethiopian Hebrews before they left for uh, uh, Israel back in the 2000. Uh, and you have a, so most of them are gone, but you have a community left, uh, left behind. And they have two, and there's two different stories about this. The biblical story is of the story of Sheba, uh, who's actually, the Ethiopians called Mekada, who was a ruler at the time the emperor, the empress at the time, making a state visit to Jerusalem to visit Solomon. On that trip, because they say Solomon, who was a philanderer, Max, <laughs> you, you guys, people think about five or one woman, but Solomon was into, you know, 20 to 100. Ethiopian women are drop dead gorgeous. So Solomon um, sends, um, according to the, and, well, the biblical stories, she goes to visit Solomon and she returns. The Ethiopian story, <clears throat> in their book called the Kabrina Gosh, the Glory of the Kings, say, yes, she went. She stayed for a while. And on the night that she was to leave, Solomon seduced her. She returns home. Months later, nine months later, she gives birth to their child. She calls this child, um, I think it was Hakim, and later when he comes to the throne, his name is Menelik I. When the child becomes a teenager, he, she want, he, the child wants to go visit, see his father. The mother, Makada, said, okay. And the child decides, according to the Ethiopians, to be discreet. It's the Ethiopian way to be discreet. So instead of being having a formal audience with his father, the child decides to just blend in with the temple worship every morning because temple worship among the Egyptians, among the, the uh, Hebrews at the time, uh, and the Ethiopians still now, is begins before dawn. At dawn, it ends. So 4.30, you know, it comes up at 6.00. 
sun comes up at six on the equator. So 4.30 services begin. In those sessions of temple worship, he is spotted by members of the court who see the uh, resemblance of him and Solomon. And they take him out and they take him to Solomon. And Solomon receives him and finds the truth of what this kid is and who he's from. Solomon falls in love with this kid like none of his other, like none of his other kids. The kids you know, brilliant, the kids, you know, all kinds of things, the manner of rulership of a king. So at some point, Solomon's courtiers become jealous of the attention he's paying to this kid. And they urge him to send this kid back home to his mother because they don't want to jeopardize their political positions at the court. So Solomon, in his great wisdom, says, okay, if I must send this kid back, which will break my heart, then you would have to send your firstborns with him to set up a Hebrew state at his mother's. So this is the return, begins the return of Menelik I back to Africa. But on the way, unbeknownst to Solomon, the firstborns who had to go back and their parents had to give them up had been raised in a society where they were taught that Israel existed because the Ark of the Covenant was among them. So they were quite a little ambivalent about this, following their parents' orders. So knowing the schedule of the, of the temple, they made a replica of the ark, and they switched it. And they knew by the temple calendar that it would be months before it was discovered. At that time, they were on their way down through Yemen over to, uh, whether they went down through Yemen over to Ethiopia or whether they took the land bridge and went down through Egypt is not clear. But along the way, they reveal to Solomon that they have this and then everybody's rejoicing and this in the Ethiopian religion, Christian religion, is the beginning of what they call the Dance of David, where people rejoiced around, uh, and you imagine a night or what a day where they're dancing around the ark. Now, the Ethiopians say they have the Ark of the Covenant. To this day? To this day. Which is interesting because no Jew, or uh, uh, European Jew, or Hebrews, uh, Ashkenazi, uh, or Sephardim, none of them has ever mentioned that they have the location of the, of the, uh, of the Ark. So I don't know if that's because when the Romans destroyed the temple, did they destroy the fake ark? Did they destroy the real ark? Who knows? But the Ethiopians are the only one who say that the ark is among them because of the union of their queen, Makeda, with Solomon. And that ark is still there. It is moved around in different places based upon war warring in the country. But it is a place in Tigray, the region of Tigray. There is the ancient royal city of Aksum, A-K-S-U-M. In that city of Aksum, there is the oldest church. And on the grounds next to the oldest church is a, is a, is a, a, a building, two-story building called the treasury. And in that treasury, on the bottom floor supposedly is the ark. On the top floor is where the priests go back and forth and is surrounded by a, a, a metal perimeter uh, fencing to keep people out. And did it, uh, in your research, has, ever, has anyone spoken about what's in the ark? Well, you know, the Bible describes the ark and the mercy seat and the wings, uh, winged uh, creatures. Uh, but the Ethiopians say that if you see the ark, there's only one person who can see the ark for their lifetime. The person is chosen, this one priest. And on the deathbed of this priest, they then name who will succeed him. And they say that if you see the ark, you're not the authorized one to see the ark, you will go blind. Many people speak about the slave Bible, right? But people, when I hear people explain the slave Bible, they explain it as if it's separate from the King James Bible. <laughs> and I've heard you speak about the slave Bible. So can you explain your understanding of the slave Bible and its purpose? The slave Bible is a Bible of pacification. This Bible was created by the Greek who had a slave society. It was adopted by the Romans who had a slave society. And it was used 
by the Portuguese, the Spaniards, and the English. Now the English gave us the last version, the King James Version. King James, could you imagine? Uh, King James is kind of like Abraham. What a horrible person. King James killed all those wives of his. Uh, he was uh, um, like, you know, Moses, I mean, uh, Abraham, you know, had, uh, uh, was good. He, he wanted to kill his own son. I mean, uh, deranged people. And these deranged people have given us one, the Abrahamic faith, and one, the King James Version. Uh, and in this Bible, you can Google it. How many times is the word slave mentioned in the Bible? What is What does religion, the freedom of your soul, where does slave fit into that? And if slave fits into that, that to me is already a... Um, uh, a nullification of what is supposed to be freedom. Religion, uh, spirituality, is about freeing your soul to be happy, to enjoy what the Creator has given us, to enjoy this moment. You know, our ego t forgets the fact that we did not choose consciously that we will come here as humans, just like you cannot choose when you die where you will go. There is a stronger force. So the idea that somehow we can corrupt that force is to me unholy, is unreligious, is unspiritual, unspiritual. But embedded in all this stuff, and this is how why it works, because you get a little bit of truth here and you get a little corruption there. A little more truth here, a little corruption there. So then you start swallowing the corruption in, that's been woven in with the truth. And you get to a point that, you know, you just, oh, I'll just cherry pick it. I'm just not going to pay attention to it, but I'm going to stay in, I'm going to stay in this faith. But, you know, that's where faith becomes delusional. When we ignore the, 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 uh, the stop signs, when we ignore the red flags. So people say, well, you know, if I give up faith, then how do I know I'm going to be okay when I die? See, that gets to the death insurance. You didn't know, you, you didn't have anything to do with you getting here. You don't have, there's nothing you can do about where you're going to go to the next place. Only thing you can do is live out fully this life and try to live it in a, as the Egyptians say, in a righteous way. And it, from, from listening to you explain, it seems like there's control on two parts. There, there's a, a level of control from those in power. But there's also a level of control from the recipient. Like they're trying to have some control over their life, not accepting that. How much control do we really have? Well, yeah, that's true. But the other thing, too, is that we are afraid to take responsibility for ourselves. Each and every person, fundamentally. Like we're also afraid to be alone, fundamentally. So, we've, so how do we solve that problem? We then anxiously give power to someone else. You anxiously give power to your priest. You anxiously give power to your minister. That's another person just like you. Come on, excuse me. Where do they get? How is it that they receive such power more than what you have? You have the same power if you want, if you just dig into it. And it's not about an issue of power. It's, a, it's an issue of being and feeling it's okay. Like the African religion, there's no original sin. So the Patriarch religion pulls you in and make you think that you there is original sin and makes you think that you are unholy and therefore you need them who are not holy because they're just like you. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to, um, my thing is that just like I learned at Tuskegee how to broaden my view about how we all approach the Creator, I think of it as if you look at a circle and you put a pen in the middle, how many ways can you reach that pen? So when we do a pizza cut and cut off a slice, you, you now you've cut yourself off from so much of about nature, so much about life, so much about joy of the heart, joy of the mind. You, you accept when you walk into 
that religious patriarch thing, you're walking into a prison. You say, okay, close the door. Does the world only exists here. Well, that's a limitation that we put upon ourselves that we don't have to. And, and listening to you talk in reference to the slave Bible, it seems why it's so important to have that concept of hell. Hell does not exist in African religion. Hell is a patriarch invention. Hell is meant to scare you. Hell is based on superstition. So you have to decide, do I want to live a superstitious life? You know, I'm not saying that you, I'm not telling you to go out and curse out, you know, Christians and stuff. I'm not saying that. Because, you know, people have a right uh, to being, to feeling comfortable. What may be comfortable for you may not be comfortable for somebody else. And there's no reason to demean them for that or compare yourself to that because that's ego. And if you look at the Egyptians, you don't, you don't get ego. Ego is, is trying to uh, have control and control is 100% of nothing. So if, if you can cleanse yourself of that, then you find there's no need to be critical of if someone believes something different than you, because you have that unlimited circle again. People can see life from many different parts and all of it is legitimate. As long as it's not a, you're not creating a war from it, you know? Um, but hey, to each his own. That's, you know, that's fine. But no, to each his own, I say, please learn the other parts that you right now feel you don't need to use. Because once you learn them, it may then put a lot of stuff that you do now in perspective. It may reinforce some things. It may make you question things. It may make you abandon things. But that is your right as a human to make decisions. That is you're giving yourself power. But don't make those decisions out of ego. Don't make them out of, you know, that I got to, you know, that, I, that no matter what, I got to stay in this jail. Obviously, this is a big, you have a picture of Eileen Celestia in one of your libraries, right? I, I don't have a picture. I have my picture. You have your picture <laughs> right. of the emperor in one of your libraries, right? Um, can you share with the viewers, uh, 1973, uh, how did you get the opportunity to be in that area to well, growing up in Alabama, we at that time, we had no black elected officials in the country. Because of Tuskegee students and because a man ran for, a black man ran for sheriff, we got behind him and he became elected the sheriff of Macon County, Amerson. <clears throat> Being involved in African studies at Tuskegee, have from the African friends, um, um, civil rights, I and, and involved in that campaign. I wanted to see what other <coughs> the, the, the 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 racist Americans would tell us that Africans cannot handle themselves; they cannot rule themselves. And I wanted, and I heard about because of my African friends who introduced me to Haile Selassie and Nkrumah. I heard about this attempt at organizing that and continentally of Africans called the Organization of African Unity, where once a year in different countries, all heads of state come together and they have a big weekly conference, week long conference. And I heard about this when I spent my last summer in Ghana, so 70, my summer 72 in Ghana. And I heard that the 10th anniversary was coming up since independence, the first independent African countries, and it was going to be held in Addis Ababa. And I said, well, <clears throat> I have got to go because I want to see for myself black people who are in charge of other black people's lives. So I pulled my pennies together and I got a ticket to Addis Ababa. I lived in a cheap hotel. I Got my, I registered as a, press, as a press person, media person. And for that week, I had access to photograph from the airport to uh, the, the conference halls, different ha members of uh, Africa uh, leadership. So <clears throat> each leader who flew into Addis Ababa was met at the airport 
by his majesty. So he met every single leader at the airport? He met every single leader at the airport. So this particular, the first, my first time of experiencing his majesty was I'm with the, I'm corralled with the press. <clears throat> and these four big guys start walking across the tarmac towards this plane. And in the middle, and these four big guys, there was some power in the middle that was coming out of it that wasn't them that I saw. I didn't know what it was until they stopped at the dais and this little person walks up on the stand. And I'm like, what? You know, <clears throat> it's the first time in my life I took the camera from my eye because the moment was too real to have lenses between me and it. I took the camera down. I just took it in. And then the head of state came off the plane, came to the dais, they said something, and then they walked out with these four big guys again. So, so hold on. So you're <clears> telling me the emperor was radiating the energy that you can feel even though you didn't see him. Right. So when they left, I turn around to all the other guys, all Africans, and I say, well, who is that? And somebody said, well, that's the emperor. The emperor? <laughs> I mean, I came to see him. I came to see other black people who rule other black people. I didn't know there was an emperor in there, you know. I said, and then I didn't know that that person who emanate that particular power aura was local. So they said that's the emperor. I said, oh. So then tell me about this emperor. So then I began to learn from the Ethiopians their history, and. I then, every time I saw, it was in a passageway where we people were passing, we could photograph them, set up. The emperor, whenever I was in any situation I could get where the emperor was there, just to see if this was really real. Maybe, you know, maybe I was, you know, it's a high altitude place. You know, you go there and, you know, the first day, you know, you really can't run because the, you're 5,000 feet above sea level. And I said, well, maybe, you know, that has something to do with it. I don't know, you know? <clears throat> I was willing to find a way to dismiss it, that there was something else that was happening. But every time I saw him, they had that same aura. And then, I'm, and then later in the middle of the week, I'm straining when he makes appearances to see if he would notice me. He didn't notice me, but then he found, I found out something. Maybe he had, and I didn't know it, because when he got to me, I realized he was looking 20 feet in front of him. So if he had noticed me, it was 20 feet before he got to me. Then the picture, the last day there of the OAU, the emperor addresses all the delegates. And at the podium, as he's addressing all the delegates in African Hall, this is where I made that picture. <clears throat> the emperor was incredible, incredible as an entity. In fact, when I started work at the New York Times, I wanted to see white heads of states. Does anybody else have this presence? None of them have it. Then years later, the Pope came, anxious. I go to cover the Pope. Does the Pope have it? He don't have it. Only His Majesty had it. His Majesty had this kind of aura that he was with us, but he was with them. Something much bigger. He owned his, where, he, where his foot stood, but he owned everything else. His aura just permeated everything. I never encountered a being like that before. And I haven't encountered a being like that since. Um, can you share his assistance for other African nations in regards to um, providing arms and the assistance that people don't know about how he helped them during the revolutionary times? Africa is free because of this man. Only because of this man. This man had an army. He was independent. Their independence was guaranteed because of the last fight that Menelik had in the late 1800s when they slaughtered 25,000 Italian soldiers who were invading the country, the Battle of Adwa. <clears throat> when, Ethiopia, when, Egypt, when Italy was trying to tell Europe, if you want to deal with Ethiopia, you come through us. They said, no, 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 <laughs> no. Once they have won that battle, all of Europe, all of white world shook. This is the one time 
that the savage African slaughtered them. They never speak about that historically. I have a virgin that wrote a book on that. Well, you know, <laughs> there's reasons for that too. <laughs> so his majesty, because he had an army, because he was independent and because he was respected by other heads of state, because his dynasty was older than any of theirs. He could buy weapons. He can buy many weapons as he wanted. So what did he do? He bought twice as many weapons that he needed for his army. And what did he do next? He sent out through Kwame Nkrumah and other people, I want all of the independence fighters, the guerrillas, to come here. And I want my army to train them and I will send them back with arms. Each one of them were trained by Haile Selassie's army. Africa's free because of this man. So when, when Nelson Mandela was freed, the first place he went outside of South Africa was where? Ethiopia. The second place he went was where? Libya for Gaddafi, because Gaddafi was also able to do the same thing. And then the third place he went is Cuba to Castro. Why? The American government and Reagan was supporting a CIA stooley named Savimbi in Angola. Angola was a front line from South Africa coming up past Namibia, South Africa, Namibia to Angola, to next Congo. But El Castro had an idea. Fidel Castro was an Africanist. And Fidel says, look, he says to his Russian friends, I want to, let's stop this. Let's protect the Africans. I'll send my people, my soldiers, to fight the South Africans if you, the Russians, would give us arms and fly them over. That's what the Russians did. Castro, every day, was a field commander from Cuba telling people with the maps what to do. They defeated Sabimbe. They killed Sabimbe. They defeated his army out of Angola. And then they start with their big guns. The largest cemeteries in Africa, in South West Africa and Ethiopia are Cuban soldiers. After they defeated them, the South Africans in Adel Angola, they then pushed them into Namibia and defeated them there. And then as the South African army was in retreat, Bota and those boys had an idea. Let us give Mandela freedom. Let us go for a political change. That's the only thing to stop the Cubans from invading. They were on the border to invade when the white South African says, okay, we can find a way to make a deal here. So that is the story. If you Google it, Cuba, Cuba and Africa, you will get that story. They just, it's not that it's hidden from us. We just don't know anything about it. If we know something about it and we Google it, it's there. <clears throat> a friend of mine, an Ethiopian filmmaker, did a, a, a real a, a great film on it. But, so that's why the ANC, even though they had the guerrillas working, they were up against a lot, they were, but they were backed by the American government, which refused to sanction them, and at the same time kept resupplying them. They and the Israelis were selling them the most weapons. So Castro and, the, and the, with the support of the Russians put a stop to it. That's why South Africa is free. But all of it started because of Haile Selassie. Can you tell me about your first exposure to the Rastafari movement? Yes. <clears throat> after I went and made this picture of Haile Selassie, after I was impressed with his aura, I came back home and I called up uh, my best friend. I said, look, man, I said, you know, I went to Ethiopia and I photographed this guy and like I'd never met anybody like this before, never seen anybody like this before, and da-da-da. He said, well, he said, well, you know, some people think he's a god. I said, what? <laughs> what? I said, you know, in the Western Hemisphere, there are black people who can accept their divinity that look like them, that same color. This is totally revolutionary. I said, who are these people? He said, they're Rastafarians. I said, well, who was that? He said, well, they believe that, you know, Haile Selassie is a, is, is a living Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, and they uh, make this music called reggae, and there is this, I said, well, what is reggae? He said, well, stay right there. <laughs> 
he brought me over Bob Molly. And I'm listening to Bob Molly. I said, my God, this is incredible. Do you remember what album he introduced you to? I don't know, probably Kaya or something like that. You know, I said, my God, you know, this is incredible. I got to go to Jamaica. So I then tried to make contact with Bob Molly and, and, and the Rastafarians. And I got to, I got to, I didn't see Bob. I went to Naya Bingay. Then I went to another time to see Bob. Hold on now. <clears throat> you got to tell us about your Naya Bingay experience. You're I went like, to the, <laughs> well, because I said, okay, I want to find out these Rastafarians. Who are they? I mean, Bob Molly is one of them. Fine. Were, were you there but, all night? You stayed oh, all yeah, night? yeah, 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 yeah. I stayed all night. I remember, well, I stayed out several, a couple of nights. And then uh, one day I went out. And uh, this farmer came over to me. He was he and his wife was standing on the edge of their farm, and he saw me, and he beckoned me over, and I said, "Okay." And then he puts a, a shopping bag in my hand. Full of herb. A shopping bag full of herb. <laughs> I said, "My God!" <laughs> so, so on my on my posse, you know, I say, "Have some." They were like, you know, <laughs> grabbing the herb. You know, I mean, you know, herb was an experience in Jamaica because you know, in the in the states, you know, we, we roll those little things that look like a cigarette. But in, in Rasterland, my God, they, they look like, you know, uh, 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 the center of a roll of toilet tissue. Humongous. Quick question. Now at the bingy, you say you stayed numerous things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So what was the vibe? First of all, did you take your camera out or you just stood there? No, well, I have my camera, but, you know, I discreetly use my camera. I have a bag for my camera. I only take my camera out if I'm making a photograph and then I put it back in. I come from a coach of gun shooters in, in Alabama. And the, the, the gun culture is you only show a gun if you're going to use it. Otherwise, you put it away. So I do the same with my, my, with my camera. All right. At the bingy now, I know it's on the heights because they're drumming and chanting. Did you hit the chalice? The chalice. I don't think so. Right. Whatever it is. I was just into the vibe of the people and the drumming, which was Ethiopian drumming. Uh, and... Um, I was I was essentially a combination of a witness and a and I felt like an emissary from His Majesty, because all of these guys were in love with His Majesty. You know they have this they they had His Majesty came during the time I think of Manly, uh, but you know the image of His Majesty obviously goes back to to Garvey, uh, but they have a um, a spiritual image of His Majesty which. I have no problems with, but I know and experience His Majesty as a person in different environments over a week uh, and watching him uh, and seeing that, you know, yes, he is, there's something special about him, but he's still human. Um, so I would tell them that, you know, we're both in love with His Majesty for different reasons. I'm in love with him because I experienced him personally and that experience had, made an indelible impression upon my mind. Um, <clears throat> no, I did not feel the need to make him a Jesus Christ, but although he is the savior of the African continent, but I've also seen churches that his majesty has built and commissioned and that his majesty felt very strongly about, about being a Christian, but not a Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that was that conversation, but people were taken more with the fact that I had been to Ethiopia. So the fact that I had been to Ethiopia and had seen His Majesty made it, it open up a certain gate for me, a certain pathway for me that allowed me to to talk, to to uh, reason with him, and to photograph. How was your pursuit uh, to Bob Marley? You say you're trying. To oh, to Bob so Marley. then later. <clears throat> I go trying to get Bob Marley again, and I fly to Ethiopia, and I go to Tough Gun. And the night before, he leaves, unbeknownst to me, leaves to Zimbabwe. So I'm sitting in Bob Marley's chair in Tough Gun studio, listening to his new album that he hasn't dropped yet, his new song, Could You Be Loved? And I, I missed him. So I have to wait until Bob Marley comes to New York. So 1978, Bob Marley comes and he does his final concert at Madison Square Garden. Is that the famous one with the Commodores? I, he, it could be. I don't. Yeah. I didn't care about the Commodores. Right. I care about Bob Marley. All right, all right. <laughs> the Commodores I grew up with in Tuskegee. I didn't care about them. <clears throat> um, but that was my. That's where I got a chance to photograph Bob Marley uh, at that final concert. 
And it was uh, on stage and backstage? Or just... No backstage, just on stage. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not really a groupie. Yeah. I mean, I'm okay. I mean, the spirit is in charge. I'm okay. I, I, I'm not greedy. You know, I, I, the, the, my, my spirit gives me, an, uh, uh, in my mind's eye, in my spiritual eye, I have an image that I'm after. Once I get that, I'm okay. <clears throat> how did, how was your, what is the aura that Bob Marley gave off to you? That he was in love with his majesty and that he was a revolutionary um, and a humanist. Uh, and that he was, he was in, he's, and that possessed him in that possession. He acted out of that possession. And so then the next time I see Bob Marley uh, is, at his, uh, is, is at his funeral. I photograph his funeral. And because of my uh, working in Ethiopia, I understood the Ethiopian priests, what was going on there. And then, so I joined, uh, uh, so I photographed the, you know, the, the church ceremony the civil ceremony, and then I joined the, the procession that took his body to uh, his tomb, uh, photographing that. We have to talk about that. This is a historical moment here, right? Because you have the uh, funeral, the entire Jamaica is out, right? What was your response to the procession when they were driving from there to St. Anne's? Well, like you know, it was incredible because this, this, I don't know how many miles it is, kind of 30 miles or more, I'm not sure. but. Every patch of land along the road was full of people two and three deep waiting to see his casket pass by in honor of him. It's like, um, um, I guess it's the kind of thing that would happen when it, when it happened here in this country would have been when uh, the Kennedys died. But it was that outpouring of, of, uh, of grief and respect um, and just awe uh, that Bob Marley uh, was passing by, that his remains, his spirit was passing by. People just turned out. It was fantastic. And uh, as a photographer, right, how do you keep that fine line of respect while still trying to get a picture, say, of a family member? Well, <clears throat> compared to just someone in the. Uh, My uh, fundamental rule is that no means no. I think, you know, people, you know, people in different places at different times, you have to respect that. If, the, if you can convince people, uh, because I, I don't believe in taking away the right to say no, you have to ask in, in, as, as honest and as transparent as you can. Uh, I know this is a difficult time. Uh, would you mind if I do this and do this? Because I think it's important that people see it. And, you know, eye contact, full meaning, and people will make a decision. And you have to let people know that whatever decision you make, it's yours, I'll abide by it. I think that you get in trouble when you try to take people's right to say no away from them. When people realize that, that they have the right to say no, they have the agency, they're in control of this, your chances of doing something in a sensitive situation, I find, is greatly improved, as opposed to you're trying to barge in and say, Yo, no, no, no. You have to be sensitive to people. And I think when people recognize that sensitivity, they recognize that respect, then if they are going to say yes, they'll say yes. But if they feel still feel no, they, then they have the right to say no. Uh, there are a couple of people I want to talk about, right? Um, first one I would like to discuss is Miles Davis. Okay, before I go to Miles, you use the word in picture taking. I don't take pictures. I make pictures. I make pictures. Okay. <laughs> okay. All, right. All right. Now, <laughs> Miles Davis. <clears throat> I first, you know, Miles was a um, comp genius, complicated, and uh, at the time I met him, he was, uh, he had a, uh, he was, um, how do I say it? Uh, his habit of doing coke can make him quite aggressive. So I've been trying to find, find out where Miles lived and I finally found out. I got there one day and to, it was fortuitous that Miles was in his front yard at a gate talking to somebody. And I'm so, wow, this is great. So I go up to the fence and, you know, wait behind a few feet away for my turn. 
as Miles talking to this guy. So Miles t- notices me and he says, what do you want? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, but he said it in such a, you know, uh, aggressive way. And I said, well, you know, I'm just, you know, kid from Alabama trying to make pictures. I want to make a picture of you. I love your music, blah, 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 blah. So he says, okay. So then when the guy left, Miles invited me in. We start talking, he started talking. But Miles, you know, had an edge to him. You know, he would fight every day. They get to work out that coke edge he was going through. And, you know, and that's what caused him, caused his father to pull him out of New York decades before. So sitting and talking with Miles was kind of strange, finding, trying to, one, to try to find a bridge. I mean, I'm a young kid, you know? And then the other part of me is that somewhere in the back of my mind saying, look for the way out of here because you may have to fight your way out of here. So, you know, so I keep the door, you know, as I'm talking and, I, and, and it doesn't take long. I'm just saying, well, where are you going to be, blah, 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 next time. And so you so so told me, I said, okay. And I went down there. Was uh, shocked that he invited you in? Yeah, yeah. He invited me in. I mean, you know, I, he, I, I said, get, were you shocked though when he invited you? No, I wasn't. Sh- I was, guess I was because I didn't make any pictures because I was too absorbed with the potential of violence. <laughs> he, was that, he was that edgy? Oh, he was edgy. He was scary. So in that particular situation, I didn't feel comfortable saying, well, you know, let me put you here and make a picture here, blah, 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 blah. He was, this was a bad time was for him. Like snap or something? Yeah, you got the feeling he could snap. Hmm. You got the feeling he could snap. You know, there are people like, you know, drugs can do that to you. So um, the next year, <clears throat> I get a phone call. Hello, this is Miles. Like, sure, who else could this be talking like this, right? So he says, <clears throat> my girlfriend, she's a model. I said, oh, okay. She wants to have some pictures taken in her bikini. I said, okay. He said, I'm gonna send over. He says, and then he says, don't you try to fuck a motherfucker. <laughs> Oh my God, <laughs> that's Miles. That was Miles, you know? You just, I mean, he's a genius, but he was just going through a bad time. And, that, that, and he was, you know, and he was soothing himself. A lot of musicians were doing that. They got hung up, you know, with Coke or with, with uh, heroin. Before, all right, I want to ask you one thing then I want to jump to this musician thing, right? Um, how... Did you become friends with Miles Davis, or was it more of a set? No, I wouldn't say I become friends. I don't know who becomes friends with Miles Davis. And I, even Quincy Troop, who wrote a book on him, which I think is the best book on Miles, uh, I don't think he would say that he's friendly. Uh, you With Miles, you got along. That's all. You know, I mean, I wasn't a contemporary. I wasn't a musician for him to piss off, you know. You, you, you found a way to get along with Miles. That was it. It wasn't, he was not going to bend to you. <clears throat> you had to, uh, you had to adapt to him. So in that situation, I'm not sure, you know, if it's a situation that you would, that you would make friends living like that. Did you get paid for the job? Did I get paid? No. <laughs> all right, all right. I was too scared to ask. All right, all right, all right. And I, uh, another question I want to ask. So, um, there's this notion about the, the crazy jazz musician, right? Yeah. And I've spoken to other contemporary jazz musicians, and they said it's just a myth. Um, in my experience, right, once you reach a certain level of genius, particularly in music, it seems like, not aggression like Miles Davis, but it seems like the mind goes to a different place. Well, they, they're dealing with a different language. Did you experience <clears throat> that being around jazz musicians? Yeah, Monk was like that. Um even Miles, I mean, Miles obviously was like that. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, Max was like that. Um, I, you know, the only person who was not like that uh, was Duke. I mean, Duke's another genius. <clears throat> but Duke was not detached. I mean, he was brilliant, that's but he wasn't word, detached. That's the word I wanted to use. Yeah. It's almost they can't relate to regular life. Yeah. They get detached. But Duke wasn't detached. 
Duke was, you know, <laughs> Duke was a playboy, you know, to the end. You know, Duke had this thing. I went to, I, I now, I went to Duke, a couple of Duke's concerts and I, I went backstage. But Duke was, you know, Duke was more suave and comfortable, you know. And I was just, I was a young kid. I think I was, um, was it 69 or 70? I went to see Duke, uh, uh, the photograph Duke at the Rainbow Room on the top of Rockefeller Center. <clears throat> and I'm making pictures of Duke inside, we're talking. And uh, Duke comes out to get ready to go and all these women show up. Every, like every guy who's brought his woman to see Duke that night, they knew to go to the bathroom at a certain time to try to catch Duke before he came in. And they all want to jump in Duke's face, right? They all want to be, you know, <laughs> be phrased by Duke. And Duke, I tell you, this is so cool. I just thought it was corny at the time, that it was so cool in the work. Duke was looking at each woman individually in the eye and says, you know, that dress is so you. <laughs> you know, that, that hair is so, <laughs> it's so divine on you. And they would go, ooh, <laughs> they would melt away, <laughs> you know. And Duke just, you know, running, just, I just say, eat this some shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, with the um, the drug thing with the jazz musician, is it a stress thing? Because I know they all run on drugs. It's loneliness. It's loneliness. Loneliness. Yeah. Sorry, it's sorry. loneliness. Because you know, I mean, if you put yourselves in their position, do you want to travel every day to a different place? How long would it take? How long would it take for that shit to get boring, and you feel, wow, you know, I really want to be home. I don't want to be here, you know. And I got to play the same thing again every night and look at this different people and, just, um, you know, life becomes like a fog, that you're playing this fog in different places, and you become suspended from your from your anchor, and so you 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 have this need to develop a friend, and that friend. They help soothe whatever pain of, of being lonely in a way uh, is drugs. I mean, before, before hard drugs, excuse me, it was alcohol. So, um, but it was, it was how do you numb those senses of loneliness? And then guys said, well, you know, unlike alcohol, if I try some marijuana, which wasn't there, it wasn't in that day, but if I try coke my god I, I can never go to sleep i can just keep doing and keep doing and keep writing and keep feeling and whatever you know uh of course heroin didn't have the same effect but coke worked and so the people who got out on heroin you know uh like cold train or whatever you know that didn't that didn't end well but uh and the heroin is what put uh miles out of business uh that caused his father to have to come and take him off the stage but coke was a different thing. But it was all this thing of, you know, people don't realize that entertainers, <clears throat> but then once say, well, you know, it doesn't happen to the women except maybe to what, uh, it did happen to uh, Lady Day. But, it, but you know, women don't find, some, uh, they cope for some reason in their groups when they travel. They have seen, you know, they have more fun with each other. Their support system is the fun they have with each other. Men don't have fun with each other. You know, that's not how we're made. You know, we, we, we're, we're all um, fortified structures, you know? And, uh, but you know, that's, uh, it, it can have an effect. And I think that effect is, is uh, it doesn't have a long as well. And that's what the, that came from. And I mean, so obviously I don't judge anybody, so I don't judge them for it. I just try to understand it. Um, and I'm not a consumer of drugs, you know, uh, like I'm not a consumer of religion, but, uh, you know, hey, different, different people, different things, you know, Richard Roundtree. Yeah. Right? Uh, he, he, died died, he died yesterday. Died yesterday. 83. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, what was your experience with him? Well, Richard, you know, uh, Gordon Parks is one of my mentors. And, um, I think the second year that we knew each other, he started doing shaft. And he asked me, he asked a lot of different photographers to shoot Richard. And, and also some days we came on set to shoot the set because uh, they want to see how different photographers saw him. Uh, and he came uh, to my studio here in Brooklyn and I did a, a shoot with him inside and outside. Richard was an easygoing guy, you know, very confident in himself. Uh, 
and um, uh, he um, appreciated good direction, and um, he um, real professional, nice guy. Um, so I did. Think, I remember uh, one day Richard introduced me to some uh, studio, uh, not studio, uh, his haberdashery. I think it was Paul Stewart. I, I went with him to uh, Paul Stewart to pick out a suit. Uh, but he was, a, you know, he was an approachable guy. You know, he he, he didn't have a, <clears throat> he wasn't full of ego, and uh, but he was full of confidence, and that was important. Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou. Okay, yeah, some classic, classic. Oh, very, very wonderful woman uh, and a great writer. And when I met Maya uh, in 1970, her book had just come out, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. And uh, she was living at the time up uh, in an apartment on uh, 97th Street in Central Park West. And I went to photograph her. And in talking, and when I photograph people, you know, you need to, the more you know about the person, for me, the better, uh, the more capable I am, the more informed I am of what to look for in a photograph that reveals him. So we were talking about stuff, and I was. She asked me uh, what I do, and I said, "Well, you know, I really want to go to Africa." And she said, "Really?" She said, "Well, I used to live in Africa. I used to live in Egypt and in Ghana." And she said, "Oh, uh, well, then you should go to Ghana because blah 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 and blah blah blah." So as she began to talk about her memories of being in Ghana. But she didn't tell me about Malcolm X in Ghana, but she just talked about her memories of the culture and the people. And she just became filled with her memories in that picture I made of her and just full of joy of the time that she has spent with the people and the time and what it meant to, not, uh, to herself. Uh, but and, and throughout life, <clears throat> when I did this book, uh, Maya called me and she says, uh, I think it comes like five copies to a, a book. She said, I need 200 of those. I want to send them to everyone, everybody that I know, every one of my friends. They need to know about Africa. And what you've shown them is a way that, that should resonate with them. How did that make you feel? It validated what I've been doing. Because, you know, as a, as a photographer on, a, on this mission that I'm on, um, it can get lonely too, because you know every year my projects tend to be very long term, and every year I'm making money to invest in the work, and you don't really have feedback while you're doing it. You know, you you have certainty in your own mind of what you're doing and why you're doing it and how to do it, but you don't have feedback from other people about it. And here. This is on the African family of man, the African diaspora. And I know that, um, and they probably, they printed 52,000 copies of this book. Only about 20% of this book was bought by black people, bought by white people. That's a, that's a different conversation. Right. But I made it for my people. <clears throat> If my neighbors appreciate it, that's fine. But I made it for my people because I wanted to add something to the, start a conversation, uh, add something to the conversation, a nudge the conversation about why, uh, why, how can we change our negative attitude about ourselves and our African cousins? So um, I'm very proud of what I produced. I'm very proud of the 25 years of actually living in so many places around the world, along the Atlantic. I'm proud of the years I spent researching where to find these images, what time of year to find these images. I'm glad that I, the money that I spent hiring, uh, when I go to different countries, hiring a driver, hiring a car, uh, hiring a facilitator, in some cases hiring a translator that all of that came down to this book. And so for Maya, but see, our first conversation was about Africa. Maya, even though she's very much American and people only know her in the American context, they don't know about the African context of her. So for Maya, she understood that bridge. She saw me making that bridge work. 
So for her to do that was, you know, uh, was an authentication from my elder that you, this is the, this is a good path. You're in the right path. Thank you for doing this. Um, so that's what that was. You think the spirit knew that you needed that at that time? The spirit is in charge. It knows what you need when you need it. When there's a picture that I miss, I don't get upset about it because I said, if the spirit intends for me to have that picture, it will create it again somewhere else. I'm, I'm just following the spirit and I, I can do, uh, and I'm comfortable with that. All right. So I want to talk about your masterpiece sacred now, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, can you explain why did it take you 50 years to finish? I had to learn. I had to learn uh, the terrain. I first went to Egypt in September 1973, supposedly for 10 days. And then the October 73 war broke out and I was stuck for another month. There again, in retrospect, the spirit is in charge because I had become so fascinated with what I saw in those two weeks. And so uh, my imagination was captured. How could it, what is it, how could it be? Why don't I know about this? Why don't I know about these black people? These magnificent, smart, rich black people. So I had another month, I was delayed. I had another month that it was nothing to do, complete boredom, unless you went to the museum and start looking at stuff and studying stuff. And that's what the spirit gave me another month. <laughs> then I came back and I started reading everything I could read. I could buy in bookstores. And then I got to, and that took, you know, its own course because, you know, ancient Egypt, when you first come to it, imagine it's like a huge ocean of knowledge. And it's like an onion, it's layered. And the first thing you see <clears throat> it may be connected to something at this time. The next thing you see may be connected to that time. The next thing you see may be connected to something else. So I had to first learn what the ocean looked like, all of it, before I could decide where I'm going to dip and what, what resonates with me to tell my story. So I had to learn Egyptology. <clears throat> I had to learn from books that were not available to the public, I had to learn how the world of rare book dealers. How was that experience? Because it's a whole different <clears throat> world it's, there. It's a whole different world because, you know, and so contemporary books, we we'll say are books that are published after 1950. Rare, book, rare books can go back to the late 1800s, 1900s. Uh, and then, you know, you have books that are in English, you have books in French, books that are in uh, German, um, and you have also these associations of Egyptologists. Now, Egyptology, if, if, let me say this, Egyptology was designed as a curriculum to separate the memory of Africa from Egypt. That's the only reason it exists. You don't have uh, gonatology. You don't have Ugandatology. You have Egyptology. You don't even have uh, Englishology or Francetology. Egyptology is set up by British people and the French people as a propaganda tool. One, they had to acknowledge that these people were greater than they are. But two, they had problems emotionally accepting that because these people were black. And three, in order to protect their, their program of enslaving black people, they could not let black people know that they were more than savages, that in fact they were smarter than all of us. So they had to put a guardrails around that. They had to fence that in. And that fencing is called Egyptology. Now inside that fence, is uh, people who are doing a lot of research, a lot of digging, a lot of interpretation, who have access to a lot of stuff that we've never ever heard of. So I had to get to be a part of those groups. 
and they are very big on degrees in Egyptology, which I don't have. But what I did have was a track record of being serious and being and having the legitimacy of being a staffer for the New York Times. And I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> um, how did you get access to these? <laughs> like, all right, before I ask access, how do you identify the place you want to pursue to take a picture? That come from study. All right. That come from study. And that, that depends, because then what I do in study, I want to make sure that I keep it in a certain period, time period. And then in that time period, I have to decide, okay, well, what has already been done that is misleading? So in Egypt, people have done uh, Egyptian power, architecture, religion, uh, uh, the Napoleon people did, you know, everything from plants, whatever. I had to decide where in this ocean do I dip to tell the story of the African that I see engraved on the walls of their tombs and on their temples. So how do I, first thing is how do I disengage everything else that's attached to it and find a pure stream? And then how do I follow that stream? And then how do I connect and do something Egyptologists don't do? See, Egyptologists stop at the border of, of Sudan, because that's Africa. They don't want to, they can, they can massage this Egypt thing. But if they go to Sudan, then keeping it in the Middle East gets more problematic. So they stop at the border of Sudan. Also, what I have a problem with is Africanists stop at the border of Sudan. They give up Egypt because they have been indoctrinated that Egypt is, is, is the Egypt of the conquerors, Egypt of the Greek conquerors, Cleopatra, Egypt of the Roman conquerors, Egypt of the Persian conquerors, Egypt of the uh, Turkish conquerors, so, and, and now the Arab conquerors. So I, I have a problem with both of them. I have a problem with e Egyptologists stopping at the border of Sudan, Northern Sudan. I have a problem with the Africans stopping at the border. But I understand that they just don't know. Africans, African Americans, Africanists, they tend to concentrate, and understandably so, but the history is, is more recent, they concentrate on West Africa. So from the slave trade era countries, which is no problem. I lived in those countries. I know those countries. What they don't know is East Africa. So in my book, uh, this book, Feel in the Spirit, I start off from the beginning. I say most ancient place. Our most ancient place is East Africa along the Nile River. So I touch on it. So this book, Sacred Nile, I just, I, I just go deeper and I, but it's all about what connects us to Africa, what connects Egypt to Africa, Sudan, and Ethiopia is the body of water, the Nile. So then I tell our story, I tell our history based upon our imagination. We produce, the African mind of imagination has produced the whole conversation of humans with the Creator. We were the first to establish a belief system. And that belief system, portions of it, still exist today. That's the strength of our imagination. Africa, Africa's imagination gave us spirituality, gave us an understanding of the world. And that spirituality went up and down, back and forth along the Nile from Ethiopia the children and cousins of Ethiopia who made up the Nubians and who made up the Egyptians. Because Egypt is in between a huge desert. You cannot survive coming into Egypt from the outside without a lot of preparation. You can't move huge communities. But you didn't have to do that. The huge communities came along the migratory route of the river, which was the superhighway of the ancient world. And in that river, as they came down the river from 6,000 feet above sea level in Ethiopia, the river drops down into Nubia, drops further down into Egypt. All they had to do was walk the river. And by walking the river, you were able to establish colonies, colonies and settlers of the Ethiopians, the Aksumites, who came down, settled out of Abyssinia, uh, Kush, Kush, uh, 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 into Nubia and those people, as it got bigger, they moved and settled into the desert into what now is Egypt. So my thing was to follow this transmission 
this cultural exchange that went along the water, how belief in spirituality and nature went one way, and then after so many thousands of years for political reasons, it bifurcated and became a Patriarch religion. And then that religion started traveling back up and down the river. So the water, the, that, the water of life, <clears throat> the, it became the transmission of culture. And my whole thing was to, and it took me decades to figure that out, but my whole thing was in to follow that transmission and, uh, and, and, and give credence to its ownership uh, and to the agency of, uh, of the sacredness of black people. And that's what sacred now is about. How, how did you get access to some of these, to many of these sites that are not accessible to most people on earth? Like, how do you get access to these sites? I got access because I knew Egyptologists who were working in these areas. When I found out about areas, Egyptologists have to get permission from the Egyptian government to work in areas. Uh, that's a very complex kind of thing. Uh, and so two ways. One was teaming up with people who, I, Egyptologists who I met here to work on stuff. Uh, and then the other thing was that I have this Egyptology uh, mentor who's like considered an expert in mummification, who we became friends. And there was an opportunity from a BBC and the Discovery Channel over a period of five years for him to be uh, talking heads on Egypt shows. And they were able to get permissions for access to a lot of stuff that people don't normally see. And because of him, I was brought on as a production photographer. So as a production photographer, uh, which they had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for permission for access to all these places, I was a shadow doing production work. And through that, I was able to do a humongous amount of work uh, in color. Uh, because I had been forward just doing it in black and white. And then, um, I, and, but as while I was working on this book, I, 1992, I think, I took my, my son was being a major asshole with his mother in, in uh, high school. And uh, she was pleading for help. So I said, well, uh, let me take him. Uh, we, he and I need to talk. And I says, okay. Uh, he liked Haile Selassie, and that year Haile Selassie was supposed to be reburied in Ethiopia. So I said, well, let me take him on a six-week trip with me to Egypt and, and Ethiopia. In Egypt, he cannot speak Arabic. In Ethiopia, he cannot speak Amharic. So he has to talk to me. <laughs> so so we, we experienced this together, and we had, we had, we had a chance to talk. Uh, and he came back a different person. He came back changed from it. Uh, but in one of the, one day he says to me, he says, Dad, he says, because he had been, we went to Egypt twice after the first time. He says, Dad, he says, you know, all this stuff has a lot of color. It's beautiful, but you only shoot in black and white. He says, why don't you shoot in color? Well, you know, black and white has been a pure form for me of, of human expression. And black and white is what a lot of great uh, images have been made in black and white of Egyptian artifacts and sculpture. Uh, and so when he said that, part of me felt really pissed. I felt like being Miles Davis for a second because the kid is saying, throw out all the work that you've done and start over. So after I found the, the, a compassion in my heart not to choke him, I, 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 I said, well, you know, the kid makes sense. You know, <laughs> this may be the way to reach his generation and other people, making it, you know, more lively. So I then... I walked away from all my 20 years, from 1973 to 92. I walked away from 20 years of black and white. Still have it here. And I started shooting in color. But because I had done so much, I knew what I didn't have to reshoot. But I knew the things I did because of my mission had become clearer to me. I knew what I did have to shoot. So then with the color, I start adding that in. And then other opportunities start coming, like being uh, working with the, uh, with the BBC uh, Discovery Channel and with uh, uh, Egyptologists who I made friends with. And then just also just going alone uh, as I research and knowing where to go. The key, I guess, is knowing what's buried where, where it fits in, so that you can make your own itinerary and go. And I do that. Uh, I, I go to Egypt probably once a year still because 
there's there's another line of uh, inquiry that I want to follow for a while. Um, and I don't know what that book will be. Would it be all Egypt? Would it be all Africa? I'm not sure. But that's all right, you're 77, right? So do you plan on stopping anytime soon? Or are you just going to work straight through? I'll probably work through. As long as I have the energy to work. As long as the spirit gives me the energy to work, to do my mission, then that's what I would do. If I get to the point that I can no longer physically do stuff, then I'll probably sit and write. That'd be the time to write about it, about this life. I, I was listening to a lot of uh, interviews you did, right? Mm. And it's something you said early. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you, you mentioned it earlier, but I wish you did delve on this more. Um, you speak about uh, eyes are the souls, right? To people, mm. please look at. Uh, and I just want to know, like, what do you see when you look in people's eyes? Well, I try to see them because um, the eyes, are, for me, are very revealing. You know, uh, one of the things I learned from uh, <clears throat> from Miles, you know, I said Miles liked to box. And uh, Miles says to me that when you're boxing somebody, you never look at the arms. You always look at the eyes because the eyes are going to tell you what the arms are going to do. So, <laughs> and I thought that was pretty interesting that, you know, the eye portrays what's going on because, you know, the Egyptian would say that, you know, um, the eyes feed the heart if, and the heart is what you are. Um, but I believe that eyes are windows into the soul. Uh, you can tell when people are disturbed by looking in the eyes. You can tell the level of comfortability by looking in the eyes. You can tell the level of engagement by looking in their eyes. Uh, you can tell the, their level of uh, smartness by looking in their eyes. So to me, the eyes don't lie. And it gives me, and everything else you can, and in the body you can, you can, um, you can do a presentation of, you know. You can, you can present, you know, with your body, with clothes and your makeup and all that kind of stuff, but you can't present your eyes. So what do my eyes do? <clears throat> oh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. All right. Uh, <laughs> That's, if I told you that, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> all right. So let's leave it like that. <laughs> As a person who studied um, uh, Egyptian, spiritu Egyptian spirituality, right? Can you break down? I've heard so many different definitions of the Ankh. Please break down your understanding <laughs> of the Ankh. Because I've heard a million well, yeah. different things. Well, you know, the Ankh is the original cross, first of all. Now, you know, the Egyptians were so symbolic. Everything meant something. There was nothing that was, you know, just hap haphazard. So, to tell you frankly, there, there is no passage that I've come across that I've heard from, from Egyptologists who read glyphs that tell me what the Ankh says other than long life, forever, eternity. Now, <clears throat> but the Ankh, since the Egyptians were so symbolic, the Ankh also could represent very easily human society. Um, it represents, you know, and the staff is important. The staff is that thing of authority, so the bottom of it can be authority. Um, People, I think when you look at the Ankh, you immediately see two main elements. The element of the oval, which suggests the womb, how we come here. And the element of the, of the male, the, and the combination, uh, the conjugation of those two. So if you look at it from the conjugation of male and female, then the arms easily represents offsprings. And, but it's, it, since there's two arms, it represents balanced. So could offspring, so offsprings could be a two, whether that's twins or whether that's a uh, boy and girl. Twins are very important in African religion as well. So, uh, and then if you want to look at it astronomically, you're looking at it in terms of straight ahead. Imagine if you lay it down and you raise the oval up, you're looking at a sighting piece that looks at the sighting of the sunrise or sighting of uh, stars, like you have uh, the cross of the south that's in the desert that you use to navigate with, that you put the oval on a certain star, and then the how the, how the arms fall uh, help give you, uh, becomes a, a navigation tool. 
So those, when I think of the Ankh, those are the three things. Is it longevity for eternity? Uh, is it um, the human society? Is it a uh, uh, horizon thing? And the, the last thing, the fourth thing, is that people sometimes uh, um, uh, say that it represents the sandals of the Egyptians. Or you have the round sandal going around my ankle, and then you have the one thing that goes out and holds the, the bottom down between the toes. So I'm not prepared to say each which one of those is the best, but I think that it, uh, it, as in all things Egyptian, you can come to many conclusions based upon symbolisms. An eye. Well, this eye, <clears throat> I, I, I made this. I made this design in 1983, uh, after I come going through a divorce and had some clarity. Um, uh, and I think one of the things that helped me survive that uh, period, which is a very difficult period for all. Uh, everybody who goes through a divorce is was my uh, love for photography and my love for Egyptology. So this eye is the eye of Horus. Eye of Horus had two. The one represented the sun of activity, the active eye, uh, the male eye, and one represented the moon, the, the nurturing spiritual eye. So I did. I I took the spiritual eye, and I took a cartouche, which is a uh, Egyptian king names are always enclosed in a cartouche. It's like a, a rope uh, with a bottom on it. And I took this cartouche and I decapitated it. <laughs> and I made it, a, in my mind, uh, a, uh, a celestial sailboat. So I interpret this as the, the, the spiritual eye traveling on a celestial sailboat, which could be the sun or the moon. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate <laughs> we appreciate all the information you shared today. My pleasure. All right, cool.